Um, hello, Meg Vaughan. <laughs> Hi, David Finnegan. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm very well. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I am Megan Vaughan. I am a, well, what am I? Um, I guess if you'd have asked me that question two years ago, I would have said, I'm a theatre blogger. And now I kind of feel like maybe I was a theatre blogger, and now I'm more than that. Not like in an egotistical way, I'm now that I'm much more important than that. But now I, I'm doing less of that, and I'm doing more of other things. Mm -hmm. How would you describe yourself, David Finnegan? Um, I, I would usually say I'm a theatre maker. Um, but that term sometimes makes people think that you actually build theatres. <laughs> so I call myself a writer and maker. Those yeah. are the two terms. Sometimes performer. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot more loose, I think, than yeah. you were to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. And what are you writing and making right now? Um, performance. At its performance, but also um, that that's getting away from me a bit. Maybe that's something we can talk about. Okay. As well. um, okay. I thought I was just making performance and everything hung from that, but now not so much. Okay. Yeah. What why not? Let's let's get straight to it. What what's changed? Why what what's ex where have your horizons expanded and why has that happened? Sure. Okay, well, I'm from Canberra in Australia, which is a pretty small town. Um, it's a great town. It's got an amazing community, like a really supportive arts community. Um, but it's got a kind of limit on how many people there are, so how many people will come see shows and how much money there is. So you really can't be a kind of artist of the kind of art that I make in that community. But I haven't really found another community that I want to make mine. So... I've been hopping about a bit and mm -hmm. kind of doing a few months in one city, a few months in another. And the kind of upshot of that is that I haven't really built a community anywhere or an audience yeah. anywhere. And so I don't think I can I don't think I can ground myself as a performer because I think to do that you need an audience that you kind of return to and perform for and build and grow and respond to and I think I'm a lot more all over the place. So I'm now trying to think about what does that look like as an artist. If you're a performing artist but you're not in one place often enough, maybe your art has to have some kind of, you leave some kind of trace of yeah. it online. Or Do you feel like you are a perpetual visitor and that, that that kind of visitor status becomes a theme in your work? I or don't. Is that a leap? No, I don't feel that, but I get that a lot. Okay. Like that's the. I think that's how I'm seen, and that's not something I kind of feel, but that's something I. I kind of. It's probably put on me quite a bit. Um, yeah. Like I just did. Yeah. But <laughs> Sorry it, about that. No, it makes sense. I mean, I, I'm not. I don't have a fixed address. I don't have a kind of. Yeah. I don't have a lease anywhere, so it, it makes sense. But it's not internally how I how I think of myself. Okay. Um, I think of myself as having either lots of homes, or one home which I only rarely go to. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then again, I kind of feel like my community is, it's not like I'm visiting, I have a community, it's just really dispersed. But I don't think I'm the o alone in that, like, you know, we're, we're doing this for a digital writers festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think a lot of people in my networks, you know, we move cities really regularly. You don't lose track of your old friends just because you don't live yeah, in the same yeah, place yeah, as them yeah, anymore. Yeah. We're all connected. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I have a network that's much bigger than a city, or rather it's yeah. the same size, but it's dispersed across cities. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting, actually, because when I was saying that at one point I felt like what I was was a theatre blogger, and now I feel like maybe I'm doing different things, I think a lot of that to do, but a lot of that is to do with the, the online networks that I have built up. Mm -hmm. as a theatre blogger so it's almost like I'm in this process of translation or evolution at the moment in that um, there was a time when I had a um, kind of a strong following I guess not a massive following but a kind of uh, a, a community online on Twitter primarily that felt like my gang mm. and felt very much like 
I was uh, in the center of something and able to to draw on everything around me in that network all of the time. And I think that there has been something about perhaps falling in love with the theatre blog as a form, falling out of love with that as a form, sorry, and falling kind of in love with the idea of the community more. Mm. And kind of, it's almost like something started me off on a path. And now what, what it's left me with is this great network and almost nothing to nothing to take to that network at the moment like right, I, it right. kind of feels like it almost feels like I'm um, I'm not contributing mm. like I once did and well, could we could, could you go back and t- sort of tell that story I'm curious like how did you come to I mean yeah. how did you come to theatre blogging to begin with um, okay so I have always been a writer and I have always been um somebody who wants to record everything like I've like my teenage diaries are you know hundreds of volumes in length and you know then the internet came along and I discovered that oh if I just press that button and that button then maybe someone will read it and I I guess that my first impetus behind all of that was more about having something to say and wanting to share it Mm-hmm. Um, and enjoying the process of writing, enjoying the process of documenting the world through my eyes, um, and not so much trying to craft a work out of that, but trying to, you know, learning my own voice, basically, mm-hmm. learning where, what my style of writing is and how I fit myself into my relationship with the world, but my relationship with writing and where the two meet. And that's been a very, very, very long process from being a teen, from being a child mm. to being a, 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 a teenager and then kind of a, a young adult who, as well as starting and developing this relationship with the world and writing, I started to develop a relationship with art. And um, first of all, music, um, that was the art form that I discovered first. And that's the art form that I spent kind of a lot of time in my teenage years and early 20s writing about like wanting to be a music journalist wanting to do record reviews wanting to go to as many gigs as possible when I was living in Manchester and then kind of going through a process of discovery with performance which I'm still in like I'm still discovering new kind of threads as an audience member um and because writing about my life was so much a part of my life it was a natural thing to continue to kind of document that. And it it became more and more critical and more and more, less and less like a diary entry about what I saw at the theatre last night Mm -hmm. and more and more like I went to see the show and this is what I thought of it. Um, And I think that reached reached a peak in kind of 2013, 2014 when I was freshly in London, freshly graduated um, and just overwhelmed by the options just you know wanting to go out every night see everything it all felt so fresh and exciting and just that was all I wanted to do I just wanted to go and see shows have a glass of wine afterwards go straight home write about it that like the perfect life for me um and and on a blog on a blog yeah so what what did the what do you think the 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 nature of blogging to that writing? Do you think it sort of shaped it or, or kind of affected mm. how that happened? I'm not sure that, well, it's kind of, it, you can't have one without the other, I guess. The thing that really shaped it is a growing audience. Mm, okay. When I reached a point when I started to feel like actually I had a readership and I had a duty of responsibility, not so much care, but there were people that started to expect something of me. Like, mm. it reached a point where I couldn't say online that I was going to see something without people going, can't wait to see what you write about it, you know? And I was just like, oh, can't I just fucking enjoy the show, you right, know? Right, right. Um, and also um, that, that, that fresh and exciting feeling, the, the joy that comes with moving to a big city and having all of these options on your doorstep, eventually, you know, I say eventually, like two years down the line, mm. started to get a little bit stale, started to feel like, I was seeing the same things and, you know, not being stimulated in the way that I was. Um, and 
now, having having made a decision like <clears throat> at the beginning of this year that I was just going to take it a little bit slowly and not put so much pressure on myself to constantly document, constantly share, constantly review and analyse, um, that I'm now in a place where I'm starting to do other things. Right. Um, and starting to scratch some other itches, um, which is great in a way, but I also feel like there's unfinished business sure, around that sure. blogging thing, and especially around the community of people that I've built up around it, mm. who I guess for a certain short amount of time anyway were looking to me, amongst other people, but were looking to me and a few others for kind of, you know, you know, news about what to go and see, you know, what, what, what should they buy tickets for? I put you know? myself in that category, but not, not for what I should go and see, but as someone who was, um, maybe, no, as someone who was, like, excited by theatre through yeah. your, through your perspective, and I, you know, I confess, I make it, but I'm often not very excited by seeing it. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I fall in that bracket of artists, I'd rather be performing or kind of participating than actually just an audience member. Yeah. But, when I read your work about it, I would get excited, I'd get ideas, I'd get kind of, you know, it, it awoke that in me. Yeah. Um, and that was from the other side of the world, that wasn't sort of... Oh, you know, that was incredible. wonderful. <laughs> uh, um, but then, you, yeah, beginning of this year, you kind of, you shifted platforms for one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that about, though? Oh, man. Well, that, I mean, that was, I think I would have done that anyway. Mm -hmm. I think that the shifting platforms, so... Um, for the viewers at home, um, I was uh, for many years using Tumblr. Um, I, I didn't start blogging on Tumblr. I started blogging on, you know, MySpace like way back, um, and that moved um, onto the blogger platform and then onto Tumblr, where it was for probably four, four plus years, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and I just started to feel like that wasn't wasn't the best, most up-to-date. Mm. Um, I'm he hesitant to use the, the phrases like in the words cool or credibility and things like that, but I suddenly had a moment where it felt like the Tumblr platform was being abandoned. Mm. Apart from a few kind of key communities, like there's a lot of um, important like fandom communities mm -hmm. and particular kind of music communities that still congregate on Tumblr, but it felt like in for what I was using it for, it wasn't necessarily the right thing anymore. Mm -hmm. Medium happened, and while I don't, while there's something about Medium that feels slightly restrictive in the way that they really do encourage you to post long form text posts that you can't always change the look of very easily. Um, the again, the kind of the the sharing ability of it and the fact that I could create my own little space within it felt felt appropriate. Mm. It felt like it was time to move on. Um, but so I that, guess it just kind of it coincided with the shift. Yeah, that's, so, you know, it, it did. The, the thing that jumped to me straight away when I saw the medium sort of yeah, um, yeah, yeah. blog you're running is that it was fewer and probably longer. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And also I there was something about retreating from a readership as well. To mm. be quite honest at I had got to a point where it felt like it felt like I couldn't experiment anymore, and it also mm. felt like when when I started my blog, it was a mix of things. It was a mix of um, personal posts about my life, about things I'd discovered from any genre of culture, from any any part in the world that I liked and was interested in, and then obviously my interest in theatre and performance just exploded, and that's what it became known for. Mm -hmm. You know, people started reading me because of the theatre reviews, but I still wanted to express those other things in my life. I still wanted to talk about that stuff, and I couldn't. I it felt like I couldn't just post a today on the tube this happened sure. because people were like what's she doing you know why is why is Meg the theatre blogger telling us about her morning commute sure. I don't give a fuck about this was this like explicitly or is it just the kind of oh, you know, oh I mean when you're in a position where you post almost everything that you post has an immediate response and I don't want to see, seem like I'm the most ungrateful bitch in the world here but genuinely it does become a little bit oppressive you just want to you almost don't want anyone to read for a little mm. while, especially as I was finding my feet and deciding what I was going to write about, how I was going to write about it, how it was going to fit into some of the other things I was doing. And, like, my blog had been my 
apart from kind of social media feeds, my blog for a long time had been the only, my only outlet on the internet. Mm. And there were certain projects that I was enjoying and, and wanted to preserve that were getting lost in it. Mm. I kind of felt like what I wanted was the blog to be one of the things I do. Sure, sure. Alongside some of the other things I do. So, so yeah, there was a lot of change. Mm. Um, Did it kind of all creep up, or is this something that, like... Yeah, the, yeah. yeah, I think so. I think so. I don't want this to become, like, some kind of Agony Ant-style relationship, but um, I definitely needed to go, hold, hold on, let's mm. stop, let's think about this. And it's almost like the change from... Tumblr to Medium felt felt like not only it not only was it the right thing to do anyway, but I wasn't bothered about not bringing my audience with me. Sure, I just wasn't worried about that at all. I was grateful for the opportunity to start building something different hmm. from scratch. Cool. I guess how you must be like whenever you what you were saying about hopping around between communities. What may, maybe what I was looking for in that shift in platform is something that you feel like you almost have to combat when yeah, you're moving around i don't i don't have an audience and never have so that's the difference between you and i like i don't really have people like no, not in any sort of not in any kind of numbers people that uh attend my work um i think i don't i i don't think you should do yourself down with that though i don't like you're making work in a live context mm. for people to come and sit in a room with you. Yeah. You're not writing some... I mean, you are writing, but you're not... That's not your primary kind of... The internet is not your primary way of disseminating your work, I guess. No, well, I, I so, mean... So don't do yourself down by saying you don't necessarily have an audience that comes with you. Because no, it's a harder sure. thing for them to be in the room with you. No, and it's a different thing. It's like yeah. the, the kind of narrow and deep engagement versus the broad and shallow engagement. Yeah. But um, I guess in a way, like, I mean, all of the sorts of things that you're facing in terms of needing to retreat from people who've kind of mentally boxed you in, that's not stuff I've ever had to deal with. I've never yeah. had anyone try to guide or shape or push me in a direction. The problem I've had, probably, yeah, the, the problem I've had is that everything I've done has been so scattershot in terms of how it looks. There's no obvious through line. Okay. I'm all across a lot of different. Like how, like how um, there's certain performance companies that you can see their subject matter recurring. Like yeah. you know, you know, even though Force Entertainment make shows that look very different from one another, there is the Force Entertainment style. That you know what you're getting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what you're getting from yeah, exactly. that with them. Yeah. Um, and you could do a blind taste test. Yeah. Almost. You know, not <laughs> yeah. to you know, not to kind of diminish what they've done, but no. I mean, to carve yeah. out your own sort of niche is incredible, and that's something that I'm kind of, I guess, my shift, especially this last year, is to kind of ask, well, what is the kind of what is the thing that, that gathers all this stuff together? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather than feeling like I've been kind of restrained and I need to kind of expand out of a box that I've gotten myself into, it's a lot more like I've done this project over here that's about science performance interactivity. <laughs> I've done this performance over here that's about um, that's about Miley Cyrus. And Justin <laughs> How do Bieber. I put those two things into a box? <laughs> yeah, what's yeah. or what's the thread that connects yeah, yeah, all this? Yeah. Like I'm interested in I'm interested in these pulp trash genres. I'm interested in kind of the the ways that science conceptualizes the world in a big way. I'm interested in participatory performance, but I'm also interested in just sitting down and like, you know, a straight mixtape. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what single art form or kind of trajectory through an art form gathers all this stuff. And I don't know if there's an audience that, I mean, certainly I think the audience I have for one set of projects is not yeah. coming to see, you know, the audience that I've built for the boho stuff I do, which is collaborations with research science institutions. Um, and I came to London first time to work with University College London. Was that the thing that I saw at BAC with the table? Yeah, the, yeah. the music festival on the table? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was all about system science. It's yeah, about yeah, like yeah. how, and resilience, and how kind of we conceive of social ecological systems. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a performance lecture about all that stuff. Yeah, but a game as well. I remember yeah. I remember feeling like I was playing to win. Yeah. Like maybe that's just my personality, but I was like... No, you were definitely playing to win. <laughs> yeah, you were overwhelmingly playing to win, Meg. <laughs> um, but no, that so that that vein of work is like yeah. trying to find ways to draw, uh, not super complex because I'm not a scientist. I have no real. I love it, but I'm not 
in any way an expert. Yeah, so yeah. I'm always trying to do with that stuff, how do I take this interesting but really oblique information and try and make it, try and liven it or try and, you know, animate it in a way that is exciting to me and maybe to other people. That's at one end. And there's people who are interested in that and there's sort of work in that space. And then there's going and doing a, a solo performance um, mm -hmm. where I'm kind of rambling about Justin Bieber and kind of, you know, just really hoping that he makes the transition from child star to kind of adult pop star yeah. um, and willing that with all my might. <laughs> the audience, there's not a great deal of overlap. Um, and I feel like I want now, my, yeah. my challenge at the moment is to sort of say, well, if I drop, if I kind of go back to first principles and say, I'm not the artist I thought I was. I'm not interested in the things I thought I was. I'm I'm not sure what I'm interested in. But these are the these are the things I'm drawn to. What can I do that brings yeah, them together? Yeah. Um, whereas I guess you're now at a point where you're kind of you're you're kind of you've you've almost not finished with one thing. Yeah. But you've certainly like you you're more interested in the other directions you're being pulled in. I feel like I've worked out a lot of stuff this year. Mm -hmm. I feel like taking a break and not putting pressure on myself and retreating a little bit from my audience um, means that I am ready to to start kind of re remaking myself. Mm. Um, I, do, I don't know that I necessarily call myself an artist readily because I don't know that it really contributes what I do, mm -hmm. like communicates what I do. Um, but I'm ready to kind of reframe myself as a as somebody who puts things into the public domain. Mm. And some of that is to do with kind of starting a PhD uh, mm -hmm. around kind of theatre blogging and infrastructures and different modes of response. Um, but part of that is also just going, it's okay to do lots of different things. Mm -hmm. It's okay to deviate from the uh, public persona that you've built up for yourself um, and yeah part of that is the, one of the things I'm really struggling with at the moment is how to preserve not so much the audience as an audience because my audience are just people that follow me on Twitter like let's, <laughs> let's not overthink <laughs> this the word audience it, well, I'm not I'm not talking about like stadia or anything but um, how do I retain what is really valuable to me mm. in that what has seen me through difficult projects and has uh, kind of bolstered me when I've not been sure about something and who have become a you know a support network that I now have you know proper personal relationships with in mm. many ways but also as a mass um, have have gained a lot of inspiration from mm. like people's the discussion around art I found thriving on that platform and with those people is something that I want to find a way to hold on to. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of time before Twitter as a platform dies away. These it's things are. Last days, it, yeah, it? I mean, I actually, it's really funny actually because I actually found a. I was having a clear out at home recently and I found an old diary from 2000, the summer of 2012. Mm -hmm. I found a, a diary and in it I was talking about how, t how Twitter's over and I need to find something else, oh, you God. know, like talking about like, you know, re reflecting back on, you know, that was four years ago now mm. and I was already, you know, sounding the, the death bells. But um, yeah, I, I want to, to kind of concentrate on keeping keeping that alive mm -hmm. keeping that network alive keeping those friendships alive keeping the that uh, creative exchange alive because the internet and my corner of it anyway is a hugely creative place mm -hmm. and i i don't want that to be lost but i also don't want to necessarily stick to the 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 personality that I have made for myself. Sure, sure. You know? So what does that what does that look like to you? Do you have a kind of yeah. do you have a map or, or oh. even a kind of a sense of that's warmer, that's cooler? Yeah, I don't have a map, but I do have. I have been trying to give myself permission to follow up on ideas where ordinarily I wouldn't. Mm. Have, I would have just gone, oh, that's a silly idea, isn't that? Isn't that a bit of fun? Ha, never going to make that happen. Now I 
I'm trying to make some space for that. Mm. And obviously the space that I was trying to make for it is now being completely into by PhD stuff, mm. but the two are related. Sure. And, um, yeah, so I've been, I since since last year, I've been trying to think more about printed publications. Mm-hmm. And I know that's kind of the antithesis of everything that I've been saying about online community and kind of creative exchange and all of those things. But um, there is something about, um, there's something about only communicating creatively online that starts to make you feel like something's missing. Sure. And um, I don't know if, if this is the time to kind of ask you how you feel about this book. Like, ta-da! <laughs> um, so, just to give the viewers at home some context. Um, earlier this year, David posted to me this Kill Climate Deniers book, which is ostensibly a playtext, isn't it? It's ostensibly a doc. It's it, like a, a plan of a show. Ostensibly is the word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, the, like, that's it's, the best you could describe yeah. it, I think. It's, it's not a playtext in a kind of traditional sense. It's one of the most beautiful kind of books, blueprints, pieces of documentation I think I've seen. Um, but, it, you know, it starts with a playlist. It, start, it Each section has like a little introduction, but it, it's almost like an introduction in dialogue. Maybe you want to say a little bit more about that? Like, it's, how does... How does how does this printed publication, how do you feel about this as opposed to the ephemeral, fleeting, live moment performances that you've been making? Sure. I mean, it's unperformable. You're right. Like yeah. a, a script should be, I guess, in the way I was taught playwriting, the script is the blueprint for mm-hmm. a performance. So that you, give, you, create a, you create a script for a director and a group of actors and a yeah, designer yeah, yeah, yeah. to turn that blueprint into something which an audience can... can have an experience with and this is not that but that's also where I'm coming from as an artist that's the medium I was trained in so Mm -hmm. even as I've kind of deviated further from that that's still when I write I write in dialogue yeah this it's no longer appropriate to really write in dialogue but that's still yeah my first and you when you say that it's not really a the experience of the work it's an experience of a work well yeah like I haven't seen Kill Climate Deniers because I haven't been in the right place in the world to see it yet. But I have got this book and I have looked through this book and really enjoyed that experience. Like the relationship that I'm having as your audience member here is meaningful. Yeah, sure. It's interesting because it's, and it does, it kind of comes to, on the one hand, there's this pragmatic thing of, all right, well, as a playwright, your work is only as present as there are productions of your work. Yeah. That's sort of, yeah. that's your litmus test. And that's an age-old age old thing. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the kind of what's left on paper, what the mark you leave in terms of documentation is scripts, which are pretty, a niche audience read scripts, very small audience. And it's mm-hmm. mostly your, the people who might manifest them as productions. Yeah. That's or your, study them as scholars. Yeah, yeah, which is only after they've had a massive success. That's your, that's your best case scenario. Um, and the other kind of mark you might, the trace you might leave is films of live performances, which again are death. So mm-hmm. you've got this incredibly ephemeral art form that you're working in and it doesn't allow you to sort of leave anything. Um, that's a problem. This isn't necessarily the solution to that problem, but this is something different. This is like um, where I kind of came to was wanting to kind of leave or leave behind some of the some of the traditional structures of theatre. Yeah. And that is a lot of reasons. One of them, like I said before, is I'm not really in a position to build a kind of theatre career in the way that I think a lot of people do, where you you might sort of proceed through the, the ranks and get better and better opportunities to perform in better theatres and yeah. have a kind of community built around you. So the right dicks. That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not in a position for the right dicks to be available to suck. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also at the same time, there's this sort of leaving theatre or leaving the structures of theatre slightly behind, and that has to do with I, I think where I've come to with Kill Climate Deniers. This this play um, is like what did I say? wildly unperformable. Mm-hmm. So um, first of all, it's this it's this sort of stupid behemoth text. I'm going to show you. 
this much. This is um, this is not how a play should be written. Um, <laughs> Says who? Well, I mean, I don't. The know. Almighty play gods. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it would not be easy yeah, for, no, for anyone to produce it. They would have to kind of come at it with a particular agenda, and yeah. that's not impossible. Yeah. But, and it um, also there was something about that relationship that the fact that this is your work, but as soon as it's handed over to somebody else to to realize it in time and space um it becomes a collaborative work mm. and that's great and that's beautiful that's one of the most beautiful things about theater Absolutely. but also it's not a pure version of what you've done ever it sure. can't be i mean one of the best things i think about being a playwright as an art form is they're like the first sort of the first few years are spent grinding that idea of purity out of you yeah, so yeah, i've yeah. like i think a lot of the other writers I know who are maybe like, you know, novelists or prose writers have this, what they produce is essentially a direct message to yeah, an audience, yeah, yeah. like, and maybe an editor gets involved in a publisher, but mm. otherwise it's direct transmission from me to you. Being an, in theatre is not at all like that. Everything mm. is, everything is collaborative. Everything is mediated through someone else's creativity. And that's actually great. Yeah. And so... I think now where I, f where I feel is that what I have is maybe an idea. And in this instance, in The Kill Climate of the Night, the idea is circles around a kind of hostage drama that happens in Australia's mm -hmm. Parliament House. Yeah. Um, and there's like, other ideas that sort of sit there, but that's probably the core idea. And there's a lot of ways that that idea could get to an audience. It could be transmitted through a live performance. Um, it could be transmitted through an album. And yeah. kind of working with a musician could be transmitted through this play document text object, which is you know, like you say, it's a design. It's a design piece. Um, there's a lot of ways that a th that an idea can be gotten to an audience, and I think I'm kind of letting go of the idea of live performance is the only way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, sort of moving into the idea that you have an idea, you have a core thing, and that is around that circles all of these other possible shapes that it might take and you can manifest it as this or you can manifest it as this whatever the opportunity comes yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's possible and so this was one way this yeah, was yeah, yeah. one sort of manifestation and this was you know i could get this to you who wouldn't be in a position to come to melbourne to see a show yeah um but there is no canonical version yeah, like there yeah, is yeah. no play and this play in its form here has never been produced and I'd say probably never will be produced. Mm. Like, you know, I've done a solo kind of redux version of it with a DJ performing a dance party. Um, but that's not really this, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, an interpretation of, and anything is an interpretation of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is me kind of, I guess, jettisoning that, um, that yeah. idea. That's what this, that's what this is to me. Um, yeah. but what about you? For you, like, you've also shifted into like print publication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so I'm going to make sure we can see this. Yeah. This is very exciting. Ta-da! So this is the hardest thing in the world to, to kind of photograph. I've been trying to put some, get some pictures. Oh, there we go. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's so basically, it's, it's a horrible rip-off, right? Basically, um, earlier this year, I got massive, like, like, Basically, everybody else in the in the Western world, I got massively into Stranger Things on Netflix, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of influenced this cover because the 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 design of that show, the really kind of eighties typography and stuff, um, was part of the best thing, one of the best things about mm -hmm. it. Like, I would say that it's style over substance, but obviously it's so brilliant the substance as well. Um, but even before kind of I got into that show, um, this is one of the first things that I wanted to make that wasn't about theatre. Wasn't really about art, mm -hmm. but was building upon the community of like-minded people that mm. um, I was dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and yeah, the, one of the things that, like I've already said, that this, I, I'm really, I feel like what I'm studying at the moment, in a way, two years ago I was studying the London performance scene and mm. I was stu studying what was in the theatres at that time and I was throwing myself into it wholly and loving it and interpreting it and analysing it and thinking about it and it was sparking things in my mind all the time and I was just so stimulated. And now the thing that's stimulating me is the potential of what's been left behind when that love and enthusiasm 
dips a little bit. Um, and so this is one of those things that grew out of a two minute conversation and I mm -hmm. then got wildly out of hand. So I had a dream that was based on, well, all it was was me looking out over a landscape, but on waking, I realized it was a landscape that I had looked out over in my dreams before. Hmm. And it was kind of a semi-familiar, weird kind of hillside with beaches, but sandy inlets that went, so it was like beaches and, and coves almost, but then sandy inlets that ran this way and that up the mountainside. Hmm. And it felt like I was either hovering over the whole thing in like a non-space or at the top of the mountain or something. And then there was a sea area and in the sea there was kind of weird twisted machinery. Oh. And it was one of those really vivid dreams that you have every so often. And it stuck with me and I was kind of padding around the house in my pajamas thinking about it. And it dawned on me that there were bits of that strange coastal landscape that I had visited before in my dreams. And I just literally two seconds not even thinking about it said to said to all the people that live in my phone <laughs> um does anyone else have a place that they go back to um i'm really interested in that kind of landscape topography setting like i've just had a really intense kind of visual experience and does this also happen to other people um and quite a few people written you know said said yes they did mm. and I think that the response that morning, the you know, spending the next couple of hours listening to people talk about the places that they visit at night, like it it felt it felt kind of romantic and exciting and a bit dark in places, mm. so sort of funny in others. Um, but it also felt like this was this was that community coming together to talk about something personal to them fantastically interesting um but not about theater and i guess at that time i was desperate for things that weren't about theater mm -hmm. um so from it came out of this zine and it it was kind of a let me let me there's a couple of really beautiful things in here i mean it, everything in here is fantastic there's pieces of writing but also kind of um images that people have created that are kind of about the landscapes that they go to at night there we go that one's by maddie costa she's kind of stairways and dark corridors and things and then there's another one that's like a, a beach here as well that's serial davis who actually did something on the back of a of an envelope for me and scanned it in in sections so i've had to like piece it all back together in the, in the internet um and i guess kind of kind of in a Jeremy Della kind of way his work around fan communities uh, right at the beginning of his career when he brought Manic Street Preachers fans together to make a, an exhibition of kind of fan works right, he's right. just done something about Iggy Pop uh, Iggy Pop life drawing where he got people together to, to draw Iggy in a, in a gallery situation um, and what I wanted to do was really um, create something that would keep some of those dreamt landscapes together in one place um and i wanted to do it as um i've done quite a few fanzines in the past i spent my teenage years doing them in summer holidays and stuff and then um the last year and a half or so when i was crowdfunding for my blogging when i had a, so a little bit of money coming in it was one of the things i did as re rewards for people um and I just love it. I, I love the escapism of a crafting activity. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you find this when you're writing, there's a certain headspace that you you have to be in to write. It's an intensive period of concentration that's required. You are living in that piece of writing and you can't or I can't listen to the radio at the same time mm -hmm. or have the TV in the background or or be busy with my hands because I am so focused and I have to be so on it with what I'm writing. Mm. What I really appreciate about the zine making experience is the fact that it's a creative act that doesn't always require massive concentration. You mm. can be 
cutting and sticking and trying things out and moving things around a piece of paper and mm. thinking about how they'll how they'll look in a visual point of view. It's, as a writer, I found it a wonderful escapism to be a creator of images mm. for a short period. It's not my main it's not my main medium, but like I said, I don't want to I don't anymore want to say I'm a blogger, I write about theatre. I want to give myself an opportunity to explore the other things that I want to do. And that part of me part of that makes me feel really kind of non committal, like a dilettante or whatever. <laughs> like, oh God, what's your latest project, Meg? What yeah, have you yeah. abandoned now to start a whole new thing? But there's something that um I really cherish in that making and there's also something about this end result the the thing that I can that I can hold that I can go back to like like finding that diary in a cupboard mm. from years ago and you know will I ever find a blog post to look over again in the same way like my writing on the internet is sitting there on the internet and I have no plans and no intention to ever get rid of any of it. Mm -hmm. But do you get to stumble across a, a forgotten piece of yourself in the same way? No, you don't. Not you, in the same way, no. You go there purposefully, you make a search, you decide actively to click on a link or follow a thread online. But there's something about having a, a thing that you can you can discover when you're looking for something else yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So part of it's just personal gratification. Part of it is the what the wish to to honour the work that other people have done. Like when I've done fanzines in the past, I've mainly made them completely myself and yeah, worked this quite this independently. A, this is a really curated work. Yeah, this, as was this, the last the last couple of zines you did. Yeah, well. The, so the first one that I did um, with the input of many other people was around the Christopher Brett Bailey show, This Is How We Die, and I made it with a friend of mine, Simon Bowes, and between us we did a call for submissions and mm -hmm. we got materials together and we decided what was right for it and what wasn't, and we, you know, we put it together, distributed, we did the whole thing. And um, I guess that was maybe a turning point around my understanding of the online community of which I was a part mm. the, the the point at which I, it started to feel more meaningful and the point at which it started to feel like these weren't just discussions and conversations and daily interactions about trivial shit they were uh, collaborations of a sort mm. it, it was a, a, a community but it was also a fruitful community mm -hmm. and um I guess the design of this, the fact that it's a big square thing, probably about as big as a record, um, is me getting carried away, gathering this stuff together and wanting to make it into something beautiful. It's something you can actually open and sink into. Yeah. Like it's big enough to absorb you know, like your whole yeah. vision, your hands up, like you're holding yeah. it. This, yeah. But also that, you know, if somebody spends all, all weekend drawing a picture for me, for no money, I don't have any money, like... If they spend their weekend wanting to do that for me just because I've said on the internet that I had a dream, like, I want the, I want to be able to present it back to them with other beautiful things presented in a beautiful way that is a thank you for their time, you know? Um, That's such a lovely impulse. It's so simple, but like, yeah. sort I mean, of just... it's selfish as well. I, I mean, I, I get a lot out of it. I'm proud of myself for having curated the project. I'm using the making period as a escapism from everything else. But um, it's a combination of those things. I'm, I'm, I'm hugely grateful for the networks I've built in the last few years as a theatre blogger. And now I want to a give something back and be like you know, I really appreciate you people, you mean something to me, and I also want to to see what potential lies there, you know, I want to milk it a little bit as well. It's the magic of collaboration, isn't it? You just sort of open a space, yeah. and people fill it with... Well, this is what's new to me, I am not a collaborator, I am the world's worst mm. collaborator. Like, I don't know. I don't... <laughs> this, quite... this would suggest otherwise. Well, but maybe, sure. but this is, I mean, I'm, I'm in my early 30s now, and this is, mm. this is new to me, because I'm not, 
you know, writing for me has been a solitary pursuit, mm. and um, it's n it doesn't always come easy to me to share responsibility for things. Maybe mm. it's because I'm an only child. I don't know. Like, I've um, I can be a bit of a control freak. I don't mm. delegate well, and it's nice to it's nice to test my own ways of working and open those up and bring people in. And it's just lovely. Like you say, you kind of, everyone gets something from it. Like everyone gets, yeah. you know, if someone, That's if someone so. opens a space and says, Hey, I want things that do this yeah. and you give something to them and then that what comes back yeah. is this. Yeah. Like that's such a lovely gift. And it's in, it's important ethically for me as well because I don't want to be the person that's just take, take, take. And that's, I think, part of the things that, I, part of where I am with my thinking about what it is that I do and what my contribution to the creative world is. Mm. I don't just want to be, I've had another idea, send me your stuff. Yeah. I want to, I want to treat people the way that they should be treated and I want to make it worth their while to be involved in something and I want to give them opportunity to to steer and contribute and have a proper two-way collaboration and I'm not sure necessarily that I'm quite there yet because I'm not sure that I'm not sure really anybody had that much input into what this was other than sending me individual things. Yeah, but the cost but, the cost to be involved in this is yeah. not you're not asking people no, to kind of no. and you know, I'm, donate and money I'm, or donate and I'm, like and I'm pay, like I'm I'm paying out. Like mm. this this is the first one that I've actually sold to people, but I'm selling it at less than cost. I sure, think if yeah, I yeah. if I was to add up all the printing costs and postage costs and the making costs for the foil and things like that, it mm. would be more expensive than, than yeah, it is. Yeah. So And once you add in people getting paid into a collaborative thing, then yeah. the it dynamic really It changes the shifts. relationship yeah. as well, and there's an obligation there. And I think going back to my feeling of um, disheartenment around theatre blogging, mm -hmm. a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was crowdfunding. And that is crowdfunding as an experiment, like um, this, this platform, Patreon, I, I became aware of it, and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I want more flexibility in my life to do more of this creative stuff. I have to work full time. I live in London, basically the most expensive city in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see what it can do for me. And then as soon as I got into a position where every month I was making a couple of hundred quid, just in small donations from, you know, 50 to 60 people, um, I was almost crippled by the sense of obligation, yeah. by the fact that what had been a hobby and one of the best things in my life like just the most wonderful experience mm -hmm. suddenly became an economic transaction an obligation a tip for tat thing yeah. and and crowdfunding is particularly brutal, brutal in that it kind of puts it on you as to become the merchant and become yes. the kind of brand as well as yeah. anything else you're trying to do yeah i mean it, the impulse behind crowdfunding is great the kind yeah. of people who are saying crowdfunding is a replacement for whatever other structures they're yeah. trying to rip away. Less and also, so. like, power to the people. We don't need the organisations or the traditional funding structures to make this happen because we can do it ourselves. I love that about it. But but I was I, also... But is it... I mean, we're, how, how far into crowdfunding are we? Is this, like, five years that it's been about? Yeah, I'm maybe. not. I'm not seeing that it's really transformed anyone's life mm. except maybe the few people like you know of any new innovation a few people kind of yeah they rise to the top straight away but yeah. my experience of it has been like grinding begging pleading going to your networks on your knees supplicating yeah. and you feel gross it's and yeah like, you f that's the thing it's that it's the feeling of it's the shift in power it's it's almost like say you know having having a readership having an audience from that blog grew slowly and meant the world to me mm. and then suddenly you realize that it's there and the the act of saying i know you people are there please can you give me a five a month is suddenly there's, a, there's, <laughs> a, there's an arrogance changed. about it it's like it's like what i always say about comedians it's like i don't, I'm not that into stand-up comedy because I feel like in order to get up on the stage and walk up to the microphone and tell a joke, you have to have a certain level of arrogance that means I don't like you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I like to yeah. laugh, I like to be with friends and tell jokes, but 
getting onto a stage and going, I'm a funny person, is like... That's a particular Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That suddenly makes me go, so fucking what? My dad's a funny person, you know? Well, I was, I was not the same, but related situation with this project. Yeah, because, yeah. Because, um, not, not crowdfunding, but we got a bit of government funding for it. Mm-hmm. The very first stage of development, we got a bit of funding. We applied for like, and it says something about that as well, doesn't it? About yeah, that's, new, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of the story, really. Yeah, like yeah, you know, yeah. what happened with this project is very much a part of the project. Yeah. Um, which I think is sort of, I don't know if it's a twenty first century thing, but I suspect it's it's a part of how a lot of artists work, where things just get folded into the work. Yeah. But we got a bit of government money, and um, the title is what the title is, and yeah. <laughs> um, straight away it did what that title was always going to do, which was, you know, some outrage merchants got outraged. Yeah, and yeah, it yeah. Kind of, it went to a maybe a higher level than I anticipated, and consequently there was blowback, and all of that is as it should be, like you know, the cycle of life. It's it's no surprises, but it did make me go, well, should this play get government funding? What does it What does it mean if you got like taxpayer funded? political art Does, mm. is it like are you are you kind of crippling yourself are you taking the public for a ride like who what's going on here so i was from that point said no i'm not actually gonna seek any more funding this is going to be a self-funded project but also i'm not really i don't really believe in tickets at all as a means of income I, yeah I, yeah, I, yeah. you can't bank on them it's it's like in terms of like budgeting for a project mm. it's like pull a thing pull a figure out your ass yeah like, there's it means nothing, like... And it's going to be... You can't bank on any of it. Yeah, and the the amount that you can get for the sort of weird shit that I do is never going to... Yeah. Never going to remit costs. So I, for this, it was like, well, actually, no, there's no there's no money back. It's all... I'm sinking whatever money I have into the project, and I'm not getting anything back yeah, financially. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's a it's a money loser. Less, mm. less than I thought, and partly less than I thought, because everyone, all the collaborators kind of came on in this spirit, which, interestingly, like, if there had been money involved wouldn't have been the case like you know the designers new best friend who designed this um did an incredible job designed yeah, all this collateral cool. um spent i don't even know how many hours but a lot of time to make this thing um didn't get paid a cent and that's only i think i could only really do that if i could say honestly no one's getting paid nothing's, yeah, yeah, yeah. nothing's yeah. changing hands. you can't have one person profiting from this yeah. stuff no and that then really shifts it and so i can give it as a gift yeah. i can do the show and it's me kind of offering it to someone and hoping that hoping that they connect or hoping that they get something from it but there's no yeah there's no expectation that you get anything back yeah 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 that's not really sustainable as a yeah, whole practice yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah unless you're like massively wealthy but yeah. yeah exactly but for this project like you wouldn't i don't know what you'd charge for it but like you could theoretically charge a huge amount um what do you what do you charge i charge... if the people at home <laughs> would like to buy a coffee <laughs> i charge seven pounds um plus postage um and i think i added it all up it was going to be something like like it's costed like 12 pounds a copy pretty Mm, pretty much so i've I've dropped a few hundred quid onto it myself but i kind of feel like that's i mean i want to do it badly enough and i want to especially at this period of my creative career at this time of easing off on the blogging and trying to re-establish where I am and who I am and where I want to be it's an experiment Mm. and there are other you know other things I'm doing are also experiments and I want to just not worry so much I mean I'm in a fortunate position in a way because I I work I have a a a three-day-a-week part-time job and I have um, some PhD funding now Mm -hmm. as well so I'm basically supported by a full-time income Mm. and obviously that means i've got barely any time for anything Mm -hmm. but it does mean that i can i can be the one to sink a few hundred quid into this rather than making each copy 12 pounds you know um which is important to me and also you know it puts pressure on me in one sense because it puts a little bit of pressure onto my bank account but it takes pressure off in another sense mm. it gives me a bit more playtime and a bit more freedom yeah, yeah. to to not be constantly like this has to be a success because i have to get every penny back yeah like that desperation just bleeds yeah through exactly the yeah. that's the kind of thing that that makes people a either give up doing creative things mm-hmm. 
why Which, would you if enough. it's yeah. if it's putting you out of pocket every time uh, or start making decisions about their creative lives that they don't really want to make mm. you know doing the show that is the paying show rather than the show they want to make like the standard Which thing for it's an got artist. to kill something yeah. inside of you exactly time. and it's I've... killing things inside of people every you know people are being killed inside by this stuff it, mm. it really is and i i'm aware of that and wanting to pr- 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 to protect myself from yeah, it yeah. you know um it can't go on forever. I'm not. I'm not loading enough to just spaff all my money on this. Yeah, shit. I just want the next one in gold leaf, please. Like that can't happen. But um, as a as my first public creative project that is not theatre related, it feels worthwhile. Yeah. Well, can I ask as a final question on that? Yeah. Um, given everything you've said about this year and this as your first public creation that is not theatre related. Yeah. Do you feel like you're moving closer to the things you want or further away? I feel like my creative practice, however I would describe that, however it's changing, is is but a small part of the overall picture. No, it... I, I can't answer that question without taking into consideration all sorts of things in my life. The fact that I've changed jobs this year, the fact that I've started a PhD this year, the fact that, um, you know, personal relationships are different now than they have been in the past. Um, that all feeds in. And yes, in terms of this stuff, in terms of writing, because I'm still writing theatre reviews, you know, um, as far as all of that, it feels more connected to everything now. Mm. It used to be that I went and did a day job and then went to the theatre and then wrote about it, and that was all separate. And now, partly because I'm doing a PhD that is about theatre criticism, it feels like my explorations of kind of zines and kind of community curation and those things are still a part of that research thinking because they're reframing the theatre review mm. part of what I do yeah, yeah. and I think I'm also very be- a lot becoming a lot better at knowing my own limits as well partly because I'm getting a little bit older and my limits are you know coming in a little bit mm-hmm. because I I don't have the energy to stay up all night writing and then come in and do a day's work in a challenging job mm. and you know I I'm more sensible in many ways um yeah, what was the question again? Something about being happier? Yeah. Are you going in the right direction? I'm going in the right direction, but I'm prepared to go in lots of directions that some of which might be cul de sacs. Yeah? Beautifully put. <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> and uh, final question for you. How do you feel like talking about directions and the mm. fact that you're apparently constantly skipping around the globe? Do you feel like the thread? that you're trying to draw between those projects is being drawn? I feel like maybe it's only been this last few months that I've actually really landed on the fact that I need to draw that thread. Okay. So only now am I really starting to put that at the forefront and say, I've got all the... The other... I always thought for years, I was like, well, one of these things is going to drop away. I'll stop doing one of these things. But I don't want to stop doing any of them. And I think giving up one aspect of my creative practice is only going to diminish me and diminish the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm now really thinking, well, how how do I tie them together? At yeah. this point, the best I've got is I have a blog where I try and keep track mm-hmm. of what I do. At the very least, I just try and put all the things in this one place and say, this is everything I'm doing. If I do that and then sort of squint and look at it from a distance, I'm hoping that maybe there's some sort of shape to it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. At this, like today, this afternoon, I actually feel kind of confident that that's that that's there. Yeah. I think more than I have felt at different times yeah. in the last year. But who knows what it looks like? Exciting though. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Digital Writers Festival. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having us, the internet. Yay. Um. Yeah, I've been Megan Vaughan. David Finnegan. And that's a wrap.